the sadistic killer Levi Belfield was imprisoned in 2004 for the savage murder of two young women in London. He was later convicted of a horrific crime that would become one of the UK's most infamous cases, the murder of schoolgirl Millie Dowler. But are there still more victims to be found in this violent killer's past? He had a real thing about blondes and he told me that they were all slags and that they should all die. There was a madman out there, there was somebody out there who was doing this kind of thing. We had to stop him if there weren't to be more. My name is David Wilson and I've spent my entire career studying or working with serious and violent offenders. I'm particularly known for studying serial murderers and my hypothesis is that serial killers don't emerge fully formed when we first hear about them in the media. They're a long time in the making. So the challenge for me is not to discover when they stopped killing, but to discover when they first started to kill, to see if they can be connected to other unsolved murders. In my time as professor of criminology at Birmingham City University, I've learned one important lesson. If criminology is to have real meaning, it can't just be discussed in libraries or in lecture theatres, but it has to be reconnected to real crimes and to real people. So I'm going to get out of the university and reconsider some of the most complicated modern cases of serial murder to see if those serial killers have been getting away with murder. Criminology is the study of crime and criminal behavior. It incorporates psychology, sociology and anthropology to identify who commits a crime and why they do it. Levi Belfield was finally caught by the determined work of a detective intent on bringing his killing cycle to an end. But I want to go further by using my theories to delve into the crimes of this brutal killer. He was a sadistic bully who struck terror into the hearts of women. And so I want to investigate if there may be evidence to link him to other crimes besides the murders that he was convicted of. If I'm correct, this could make him one of the most dangerous killers the capital has ever seen. The murder that finally led police to Levi Belfield was a savage late-night hammer attack on a young blonde woman in the leafy suburbs of West London. On the 19th of August 2004, Amélie de Lagrange was ambushed on her way home from a night out with friends. A passerby came across her as she lay dying on Twickenham Green. Although she was taken to hospital, she was pronounced dead later that night. I've come to Twickenham Green, which is the place where Amélie de Lagrange was murdered. I, I like to be in the space where the murder took place because often it will throw up things that I should consider in relation to the modus operandi of the killer. And the first thing that strikes me is how open this space is. This is a place that isn't surrounded by CCTV. And so that must have posed some problems for the police investigation. My name's Colin Sutton and I was the senior investigating officer and dealt with all the Levi Belfield cases. Amelie had been found with one uh, very uh, severe wound to the back of her head. Initial thought is, well, it's, it's a really unusual place. You know, I, I knew Twickenham Green. It's just a typical sort of middle-class suburb of London. The nature of the wound first was, was just completely horrific. That kind of, of, of violence, that kind of force that had been used. It was obvious that this was going to be a, um, a high-profile and, and difficult investigation. Colin, where was Amelie's body found? Just about here. So can we presume she came from this direction to where her body's eventually found? Yeah, just in this spot, she's, she's lying face down with this uh, dreadful wound across the back of her head. Any defensive wounds to her hand? Not at all, no. It, it just really looked from the position of everything as if it was a completely unexpected attack as she's walking across the green. He's chosen this, this spot for the attack very carefully, hasn't yes. he? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's in the middle. It's, it's the least overlooked spot uh, on the entire green, and I think he did choose it very carefully. In your experience as an SIO, is this the kind of worst case you could possibly have? Oh, it is. It, it's, it, it's always likely to be the most difficult to find because the, the chance of forensic evidence being transferred in a, in a very short time like that is very low. 
Uh, we've got an open air scene where it's difficult to recover things anyway because there's public access to it all the time. It's really one of the worst sort of scenarios you can imagine as a senior investigating officer. What was the first thing you as SIO wanted to do? The first thing we did was preserve as much uh, closed circuit television footage in the area that we could and, and, and in the, uh, the likely exit routes. But Colin, there isn't any CCTV ringing the green. So what sort of CCTV were you able to capture? There were some, just a few static cameras at buildings here, but principally it was the buses. Uh, both these roads here are bus routes and the, the buses had recently at that time been fitted with recording cameras and they were an absolute godsend to us because we, we, we were able to get so much information about Amelie's movements and ultimately about Levi Belfield's movements from that footage. Chillingly, police realised that this might not have been the first time the killer had struck against a young blonde woman out alone at night. The other thing that immediately sprung to mind was that um, some 18 months previously there'd been a, an attack on, on Marshall McDonald in Hampton, which was only a, you know, a few miles away, and again was a very similar kind of offence where there was a young woman with a, a very severe wound to the back of her head in the street, close to home. There was a madman out there, there was somebody out there who was doing this kind of thing, and we had to stop him if there weren't to be more. In 2004, women all over West London feared for their safety following the random and brutal murders of Marsha MacDonald and Amélie de Lagrange. A dangerous killer was on the loose, and senior investigating officer Colin Sutton was faced with an almost impossible investigation. With no evidence left at the scene, there was only one clue buried within the hours of CCTV footage that might lead him to the killer. Within about 50 yards of where Emily was found, there was a van that parked there for about eight minutes and then disappeared. This van being at the green coincided exactly with the time when she would have been walking onto the green. We had to, you know, we had to find something out about that van. Although we couldn't see the registration number, we could tie it down to a particular model of Ford van uh, built in a particular time with particular features. Uh, which sounded good until we realised that that still left us 25,000 of these vans to, to find. Colin's theory was, find the van and they'd find the killer. He took the brave move of deploying hundreds of officers to track down every white van of that make and model up and down the country. Then the investigation took a dramatic turn. Levi's ex-girlfriend, Joe Collings, walked into the incident room on Twickenham Green to make a statement. He ruled my life for 11 years. You say ruled your life. Give me a glimpse of what life with Levi Belfield was like for you. Punching, kicking, biting. Um, he'd make you sleep naked on the floor with no sheets, no blankets, no nothing. Were you aware of him wanting to be violent towards other women? Blondes. He had a real thing about blondes. And he told me that they're all slags and that they should all die. This woman says that he's... Uh, Levi Belfield's my ex-partner. He's an evil man. He hates blondes. He hates women. Uh, he's doing wheel clamping in a little white van. And I remember saying to one of the intelligence researchers, go and have a look and see if you can find that car. And she came back quite excitedly and said, yeah, Governor, I think we might have hit the jackpot. Having linked the white van at the crime scene on Twickenham Green to Levi Belfield, Colin set up an elaborate surveillance operation. When they finally moved in to arrest him, they discovered Belfield hiding in an unusual place. Levi was found um, naked, lying under uh, about nine inch thickness of um, fiberglass insulating matting in, in his loft told us initially, oh, I thought it was people who wanted me for drugs money. I wouldn't have hidden from the police. I've got nothing to hide. At this point in their investigations, police thought they were dealing with a man with a simple yet horrific M.O. Brutal, random hammer attacks on lone women at night. But as they began to peel away the layers, they quickly realised they were dealing with a complex sexual predator. Equally, there is another interest that Levi Belfield has in rapes, often drug-facilitated rapes, of teenage girls. Did he express a desire to be violent towards other women too? Yeah. I found the rape kit. You know, like the big donkey jackets mm -hmm. that you can get? He'd cut the inside of the left pocket out, because he's left-handed, and there was a big carving knife, a balaclava, mm -hmm. and a sort of like a cosmopolitan, vogue kind of magazine. And when you went through it, every single blonde, he'd stabbed and slashed all their faces. More and more victims were emerging. In May 2004, another young blonde woman on her way home had been left for dead. Despite suffering horrific injuries after a car knocked her down and then reversed over her, 18-year-old Kate Sheedy identified the exact vehicle involved, which police now linked to Belfield. His list of suspected offences grew to murder, attempted murder and rape. 
I had the pleasure, and it was a pleasure, of standing across the desk and formally charging him with the murders. When I looked into his eyes, all I could see was a black, cold emptiness. Uh, I've no doubt that, you know, scores of murder investigations that, that I took part in, nobody was as dangerous as Levi. The Belfield case presents me with many dilemmas. He never left any forensic evidence. He was hugely skilled at disposing of the cars that could link him to the crimes. And unlike other killers, his motivations are far from obvious. Only careful analysis of Belfield's method of murder can reveal more about this man. The distinctive way in which a killer carries out a murder is known as their modus operandi. Analyzing the way in which an attack was carried out and the nature of the injuries can reveal unique patterns in the killer's offending and provide crucial clues in linking unsolved cases. I'm Dr. Rob Chapman. I'm a consultant forensic and home office accredited pathologist. Isolated blunt force injuries to the head are actually relatively uncommon. Usually when pathologists examine the bodies of uh, victims of this kind of crime, they'll find evidence of all sorts of other injuries resulting from a struggle, for example. So injuries just to the head, particularly of this severity, are rare. Dr. Rob Chapman is a highly respected forensic pathologist. He carried out the post-mortem on Amélie de Lagrange and, by coincidence, also on Marshall McDonnell. He made an immediate link between the two, confirming Colin Sutton's suspicions that these attacks had been carried out by the same man. In relation to Marshall McDonnell, what did you discover? The injuries to Marsha were to her head. She'd suffered really severe uh, blunt head injuries. And the first thing that I noticed was a number of injuries to the scalp. These are blunt splitting or laceration injuries to the soft tissues of the scalp. So are we talking about three injuries in total? I think we're talking about three impact injuries, yes, to the front and left side and towards the back of the head. When you came to the post-mortem for Amelie, were the injuries to Amelie consistent with what you found in relation to Marsha? There are differences. Again, Amelie had suffered a, a severe head injury, but a single one to the back of her head. Again, a blunt splitting injury, something caused by something heavy and blunt impacting the scalp. So if I was looking at other cases, what sort of characteristics in relation to the injuries received by the victims would you say I should be looking for? What you're looking for are, of course, head injuries, either one, two, three, consistent with being caused by something blunt and heavy, striking the head, focused on the head, and really not, not injuries nowhere else on the body. Now Rob has highlighted the details of these awful crimes, I want to understand what drove Belfield to commit them. I've arranged to meet his old friend and flatmate, Pete Rodriguez. What was life like living with Levi Belfield? Uh, very interesting. It was uh, always different. Belfield was working as a wheel clamper. Did that mean that he had access to a variety of different cars? Well, I was always less believe he had his own cars, but he was swapping all the time. And then it wasn't until later on I found out he was hiring cars and make out they were his. And he will never have a car in his name. So therefore, he will drive erratically. Did Belfield ever attack you? Well, yeah, he, he left me for dead, basically. Uh, gone up to the flat, which he had a couple of friends there. It was a, an argument, and uh, I think I've called him a fat effing sod. Uh, and gone downstairs, and with that, he's followed me a couple of paces behind. I've gone out to the main exit, and from behind, with his right hand, he's grabbed my shoulder and pulled me back. With his left hand, he's hit me on the side of the head, which is, if I show you, he's got a... Um, it's... Oh, my God. It's right in the temple. It's uh, dented straight in. Yeah. And once he thought I was dead, which I was uh, bleeding profusely, he went back upstairs like nothing happened. And uh, that was that. Although Pete told police about this brutal hammer attack, Belfield was never prosecuted. Levi Belfield was a lifelong career criminal and low-level police informant. He was an arrogant bully whose criminal career began at the age of 13 when he was convicted for burglary. He later picked up a string of minor convictions. Belfield spent years working as a bouncer in West and Southwest London, where he had easy access to the young girls he preyed on. He also worked as a wheel clamper and would use his size to intimidate motorists. Despite charging him with two murders and one attempted murder, Colin Sutton continued digging and made an incredible discovery that finally cracked open one of the UK's most infamous unsolved murders. 
Looking through a Levi Belfield's intelligence file while I was in a garage waiting for the car to be filled with petrol, I realised he lived in Collingwood Place in 2001 in Walton on Thames. Collingwood Place was almost exactly where Millie Dowler was abducted from, where she was last seen when she went missing, uh, which interested me a lot. And in my phone, I still had a phone number for Brian Marjoram, who was at that time the senior investigating officer. And I phoned Brian up and said, look, this is what's happened. This is the guy we're looking at. This is what we know about him. And this is where he lived in 2001. And I'll always remember Brian saying to me, Colin, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up at this point. The murder of 13-year-old schoolgirl Millie Dowler became one of the most sensational cases, not just in the UK, but throughout the world. But what interests me is not the conduct of newspaper journalists, but the behavior of her killer, Levi Belfield, because it shows that his modus operandi radically changed from case to case. On her way home from school, Millie was spotted walking along Station Avenue in Walton-on-Thames. It was the last time she was seen alive. In September 2002, Millie's remains were found dumped in Woodland near Hampshire. The cause of death could not be ascertained from the decomposed bones which were recovered. CCTV is absolutely essential in the Dowler case for one important respect. Millie was last seen by a friend at the bus stop. She was on the other side of the road and then for some reason that's never been explained, she crosses over to this side of the road. If Millie had continued on her journey home up this road, she would have been captured on the CCTV camera over to my right. The fact that she wasn't meant one thing. She disappears between where her friend saw her crossing the road and this spot here. One thing that we do know for certain is that 25 minutes later, Levi Belfield leaves Copenhagen Way in his red Deo. Following Millie's disappearance, this car also vanished without a trace and to this day has never been found. To examine whether Belfield could be responsible for further unsolved murders, I'm going to draw upon the valuable research skills of my postgraduate students to help focus my search. Okay, so we're going to discuss today the case of Levi Belfield. How does he go about choosing his victim? He goes for women or young girls that look vulnerable, that are alone. They're all either coming back from a night out or they're coming back from school. And he's waiting at locations hoping to see a lone female. Blitz attacks his victims, he very much subdues them, takes control over them. Definitely it's a power control element. How many vehicles did he have access to? This, um, a silver Corsa was involved in one of the offences, the red Dayo and the, uh, the white van. In terms of his movements, I think with, as a doorman he meets a lot of ideal victims that he would fantasise to kill them. But with the wheel clamping, he's actually is much more access to the victims in terms of committing his crimes. I wonder therefore, Adam, could I ask you to try and do some research for me in relation to unsolved murders of young women between a particular age group, 13 to 30, who may have suffered from blunt force trauma. You okay with that, Adam? That's fine. While my students researched unsolved murder cases, I uncovered another potential victim who lived to tell the tale. If you hadn't been able to have got up, what do you think would have happened to you? I think I would have just bled to death. I'm attempting to find links between convicted serial killer Levi Belfield and unsolved murders. I'm back where I started my journey in Twickenham to meet Adele Harbison, who in April 2004 narrowly escaped being brutally murdered. Despite insufficient evidence to convict anyone, Adele has no doubts who attacked her that night. Did you walk back this area? Yeah, so I live about 300 metres from that bar, across, came across Twickenham Green and walked up Hampton Road. Um, just got to about here, which is about another 25, 30 metres from where I live. And so somebody obviously came at me from behind because I've got massive head injuries here. I've got a fracture, multiple fractures in my skull and I've got bumps in my hands. So I was hit from behind and I was protecting myself. He must have run off. Do you remember a car following you or anybody coming up behind you? I don't remember anything. I don't remember anything from when I left the bar at Twickenham Green and, and how I walked home or when I walked home. I don't remember anything specific. So this was four months before the attack on Amélie de la Grange. Yeah. What makes you think the attack on you was carried out by Levi Belfield? What happened to me and what happened to Amélie de la Grange are, are carbon copies of each other. We were in the same vicinity. I walked one direction from Twickenham Green, she walked the other direction to Twickenham Green. It was the same time of the day. We were dressed quite similar, we looked quite similar. Um, I, it was the same type of attack, it was a hard weapon on the back of the head. I, I have no doubt. The police, I don't give any doubt either. If you hadn't been able to have got up, 
and stagger back towards Twickenham Green. What do you think would have happened to you? I don't think I'd be talking to you today. I'm looking at Levi Belfield's past and already I've been able to encounter two people. First, Pete Rodriguez and now Adele Harbison, who sincerely believe that they were left for dead in a hammer attack by Levi Belfield. He's been convicted of three murders, but it seems to me eminently plausible that there will be other unsolved murders out there that bear Belfield's M.O. Although the crimes Belfield has been convicted of happened within the M25, my PhD student Adam has encouraged me to broaden my research and look beyond London. What have you come up with? Well, I've compiled a list of a few cases here, but the first one I want to draw your attention to is of Melanie Hall in the 9th of June 1996. She was last seen outside a nightclub. Her body wasn't found until 2009 on the side of a motorway. Okay. So the vehicle was obviously used. From a forensic report, it, it's um, been determined that she had a lot of trauma to her face and head from a blunt instrument. And I think also, looking at her appearance, she resembles a lot of Belfield's victims. Okay, well look, I'll need to establish if Belfield had any connections to the Bath or Bristol area. And I think I also need to learn a little more about the actual injuries that Melanie uh, Hall received. Is there another case I should consider? Uh, yes, this next case could be considered quite controversial, uh, simply because there's already someone in prison for this particular offence. And what offence are we talking about then? Uh, talking about the uh, Lynn and Megan Russell crime. Uh, I'm talking about Michael Stone, who's already in prison for the offence. Why am I looking at this again? Lynn's daughter, who survived, mm -hmm. discussed how the attack had short, spiky hair, very similar to what Belfield had at that time, and also through an e fit through various witnesses, very much described Belfield as opposed to Stone. Well, Adam, I did ask you to think outside the box. I didn't know I'd be thinking about a potential miscarriage of justice case. There's a lot here I'm going to have to take into consideration. The scale of Belfield's offending was so enormous that police chose only to investigate crimes committed after the year 2000. Very little is known about him before this time. Both cases I'm investigating occurred in the summer of 1996, when Belfield was in his late 20s, the age which I normally teach my students that serial killers begin their killing cycle. My first stop is Bath, where 25-year-old Melanie Hall disappeared after a night out. Police made repeated appeals and arrested numerous suspects, but to this day have never found enough evidence to convict. It was in this nightclub in June 1996, which at the time was called Cadillacs, that Melanie Hall was last seen alive. She'd come to the nightclub with her boyfriend of three weeks and some friends. There was some kind of argument and all leave, leaving Melanie in the club, and she's last seen alive at 1 a.m. You know, we're kind of used to CCTV images helping the police put together the movements of people, but at the time, that type of technology simply wasn't available. And so really, frankly, we just don't know how Melanie got from the club, and nothing is known about her until her body is discovered some 13 years later. It took this discovery in October 2009 to give fresh impetus to the story of this missing woman. It was just off this slip road in the woods that Melanie's body was eventually discovered on the 5th of October in 2009. Her body had been wrapped in black plastic bin liners, which were then tied with twine. It's also significant that the road network really is a major part of this killer's story. But really, to find out more, I need to know about who Melanie was and how she was actually murdered. Richard Saville is a journalist who covered the case extensively for The Telegraph. It was one of the most baffling investigations of the 1990s. Um, police went to enormous efforts interviewing hundreds of clubbers. What sort of injuries were the pathologists able to determine had killed Melanie? She'd suffered uh, blunt force trauma. The injuries uh, were fractures to the uh, cheekbone, the jaw and the skull and a post-mortem um, decided that she died from her severe injuries. Were there any other things that were found by the body? There were uh, a set of three Ford car keys. Ford car keys? Yeah. The keys were from a car uh, manufactured about the time of her disappearance. 
uh, in 1995, 1996. I think it's been immensely frustrating, I get the impression, for the police that nobody has come forward with the... They're still waiting for the breakthrough call. This was a huge case that involved the police interviewing a number of, of witnesses, suspects and so forth, putting out public appeals, and yet nobody was able to come forward with information that led to someone being arrested. That, for me, implies criminologically that this isn't a local person at all, because if it had been a local person, they would have been flushed out with a victim of this kind. And therefore, what we're dealing with is somebody who probably didn't come from Bath or Bristol. So far, I have no evidence that Belfield ever left Greater London. So I asked Joe Collings, who was with him in 1996, did he have any connections beyond the capital? What sort of places did he go to? What, what were the key towns that, and cities that he was involved in? Did he have any connections to Bristol? Yeah. What, what were his connections to Bristol then? Mainly the guy used to get a lot of drugs off. And he would travel there regularly, yeah, once a week? Every other day sometimes, once a week. Once a month, all depending when he needs to go. Criminologically, the key elements of this case are hard to ignore. We know that Belfield targeted attractive blonde women. He targeted girls in nightclubs. He abducted and drugged victims and inflicted serious head injuries. Cars were key to all his murders, and one of his victims was also dumped in woodland. You know, I'd only ever associated Belfield with crimes with murders committed in London. And to discover that he's geographically mobile suddenly opened up a whole range of other cold cases. And one of those cold cases that deserves greater scrutiny is the Melanie Hall case. Because, you know, when you put all the pieces of the puzzle together, it seems to me that the police would do well to look again at the Hall case with Levi Belfield as a potential suspect. <laughs> Now I need to turn my attention to the next, far more complicated and controversial case, because not only is another man already serving time for the crime, but Belfield's ex-partner also told a newspaper that he was with her at the time, effectively alibying him. Could she have been mistaken? On the 16th of July 1996, Lynn Russell and her two young daughters, Josie and Megan, were brutally beaten with a hammer whilst walking down a country lane. Lynn and Megan died, but despite appalling head injuries, Josie survived. A year later, Michael Stone was arrested after an appeal featured on Crime Watch. Stone had a history of mental health problems and had previous convictions for assault, burglary and armed robbery. Stone's first conviction of murder was overturned on appeal. At a second trial, the jury heard evidence from a fellow prisoner that Stone had confessed in jail. He was found guilty again. Mark McDonald is a barrister who specializes in miscarriage of justice cases. He took on Michael Stone's case after his first conviction. I've been working on the Michael Stone case now for the last 14 years. I have seen and read nearly every single document that's been disclosed in that case. In my view, Michael Stone's innocent. But he's presumably gone through an appeal process and they continue, I'm presuming, to turn down those appeals. Why do they do that? We have to go back to the start and, and look at the case against Michael Stone. Um, the main evidence was what's called a cell confession. They put a man called Damien Daly in an adjoining cell. Now he's alleged to have spoken through the pipe at the back of the cell to Damien Daly and to have confessed to him. Uh, and that is the evidence against him. There's no forensic evidence at all? No forensics. I presume the scenes of crime officers were there and took the exhibits and analysed uh, as best they could. The, the, the main analysis actually took uh, was around a lace. Uh, a lace that was used as part of the murder, um, the prosecution said, was used actually to tie up one of the victims of the murder. And not one profile DNA was found linking to Michael Stone. We've gone back and we tried to look at this lace and they've lost it. Ah. Um, so they've lost the lace. They've lost the lace. Somewhere between the forensic services mm -hmm. and the police, it got lost. Mm -hmm. This is probably the most horrific and high-profile murder case, certainly in my, in my generation. Um, and if Michael Stone, which I believe, is innocent, then the person who committed those murders is still out there. 
I thought that was really interesting, talking to Mark McDonald, and clearly he's absolutely convinced of Michael Stone's innocence. But you know, at the end of the day, Mark is Michael Stone's barrister, so in one sense, he would say that, wouldn't he? So I've tried to do my own research, and it so happens I work with a small charity that produces a prisoner newspaper called Inside Time, which is distributed free throughout the prison service. And I came across a letter that was sent to Inside Time in March 2012 by a prisoner called Alan King. And in that letter, he said, Damien Daly admitted to me that Mr. Stone never confessed to those murders. And I said what I said to the old Bill because I wanted out of prison. So actually what we've got here are two prisoners telling a diametrically opposed story about the Russell murder. One of these prisoners is telling the truth. Now, which one? Is Damien Daly telling the truth or is Alan King telling the truth? In criminology, we're constantly highlighting how unreliable prison cell confessions can be. And it shocks me that this was the main evidence that convicted Stone. Although the jury was persuaded enough for a guilty verdict, I'm just not sufficiently convinced that Michael Stone should have been convicted on that evidence alone. So now I'm faced with a question. Is there any credible evidence to suggest that Levi Belfield could have been involved in this crime? This is a Cherry Garden Lane, and it was up this lane in July 1996 that Megan, Lynn and Josie Russell were coming from a school swimming gala in Goodenston School, took a shortcut across the field, entered the lane to get to their house. We're basing things on the testimony that Josie gave. According to her, a car passes her, her sister and her mother and their dog as they're walking back home. The car drives ahead. The man driving the car comes out, brandishes a hammer. He takes Lynn, the two children, into the woods, ties them up and then savagely beats them about the head with his hammer. I think Adam was right to direct me towards looking at these murders because there are a number of similarities. Here was a random attack. The killer uh, was driving a car, hit his victim on the head with a hammer. There was no sexual assault. Now, clearly, there are also uh, some differences as well. We're in a very rural location as opposed to in an urban environment like Twickenham. And also, this killer seems to have wanted to spend time with his victims as opposed to a blitz attack on his victims. Belfield's possible connection is far from clear, but I'm convinced there's more to be uncovered from his past. My research into the Russell case has made me doubt the strength of Michael Stone's conviction. But I don't have enough evidence yet to consider Belfield as a potential suspect. Belfield lived in the Strawberry Hill Twickenham area around the time of 1996. We also know that Belfield committed violent crimes in 2003. Well, can we take that violent activity back before 2003? So here in Hounslow Library, I'm just looking through the local newspapers to see if Belfield ever committed crimes that were covered by the local press. While searching through newspapers from the weeks surrounding the Russell murders in 1996, something immediately caught my attention. Well, I didn't find any evidence of unprovoked hammer attacks, but I did discover a photograph of a car burnt out in the Park Lane area, literally one, two, three, four miles away from where we know he was living with Joe Collins. It seems to me that one of the things that we do know about is that Belfield would regularly change his cars after a murder or dispose of his cars in some way. Vehicles play a significant role in all of Belfield's crimes. The ones he was driving in both the Millie Dowler and Amélie Delagrange cases were never found, so he clearly knew how to dispose of them. A number of witnesses in the Russell case also described a car, a Ford Sierra or Escort, near the murder scene on the day the killer struck. Does that not at least give us some connection into the, the Russell murders itself? I think I've got to pursue this further. To establish whether this photograph could be significant, I need to first find out what type of car it is. 
I've given the photo to the forensic analyst who identified the make and model of Belfield's car from CCTV in the Marshall McDonald case. My name is David Angley. I'm a forensic imagery analyst. I analyze CCTV images for uh, vehicle recognition or perhaps facial comparison and then present my findings in court. David, how would you go about identifying the make and model of a car that's been burned out? Well, normally, of course, when we're trying to identify a car from uh, imagery, there are some singular features that you can look for, such as the distinctive radiator grille of a BMW, which allows you to rule out everything else. But, of course, in this case, we're left with a very limited number of features to work from. What sort of features were you able to, to, to use then? Well, every car has pillars, but it is more usual at that time for a car to have three pillars dividing the glass. So this arrangement of four pillars allowed me to rule out a number of contenders. And were there other features you could use as well? Yes, there are. The next one, I think, of interest was this arrangement of the shoulder on the front wing, which is quite deep here by the, by the windscreen and tapers down to a point in front of the headlights. There's also the shape of the wheel arch and also at front and rear, these wraparound black plastic bumpers. Were there other things you could use as well? Well, Again, of particular interest here is this arrangement of the uh, front indicator housing. When they carried out a facelift of the vehicle in the middle of the production run, they created this wraparound uh, housing for the indicator, which is the feature that allows us to distinguish between the Mark I and the Mark II Sierra. So with all those differentiating features you've drawn my attention to, what conclusion did you come to? What sort of car were we dealing with in that photograph? Well, in my opinion, I, I'm 99% certain that the car in that photograph is a Mark II Ford Sierra. Having established the model of this car, a detail of my conversation with Belfield's ex-partner, Joe, now seems much more relevant. He had loads of Fords. And yeah, they were one of his favourites. He had a Ford Escort van, an XR3i an XR2 for a little while, a Ford Granada. In 96 we had a e Reg Red Sierra hatchback. A Ford Sierra hatchback? Yeah. I find this case really confusing for a number of reasons and the interview I conducted with Joe Collings has made me slightly more confused. When, when I was at the crime scene where the Russells were murdered, criminologically I was tending to rule Belfield out. But Joe Collings told me something Levi Belfield drove a red Ford. Now, I remembered reviewing the case files and three witnesses said that they saw a beige car, a beige Ford, uh, being driven by the perpetrator. But crucially, one witness said that the perpetrator was driving a red car. And the person who saw that red car was Josie Russell. Whilst a car feels significant, it's not conclusive. I contacted Hounslow Council to see if there's a record of its owner, but frustratingly, they're no longer held. It's not enough to decisively rule Belfield in as a suspect. I have to take a closer look at the physical evidence in the case, the pathology report. I asked forensic pathologist Rob Chapman to see if the injuries bear Belfield's MO. If you had to stand up in court, Rob, would you say there was a link or no link between the kinds of injuries you saw that Belfield inflicted on his victims and the injuries that you see in the Russell case? I would say that there are really significant differences between these two types of attack. Therefore, the linking, if any, is extremely weak, I would say. Well, that was uh, very powerful and, I think, ultimately convincing. You know, one of the things I've consistently tried to do is take a lead as far as I can possibly take it. And when I was at the crime scene where the Russells were murdered, I did say, criminologically, there were differences that I could observe there. But criminology is a, a rendezvous discipline. It's a, a place around which other disciplines meet to discuss this issue of crime. And, and here's Rob giving me his expertise from uh, a pathologist perspective. Whilst there were limited similarities, he saw the differences outweigh the similarities to the extent that Rob wouldn't be prepared to stand up in court to say that the two crimes were connected. Now, that to me, therefore, makes it very hard to prove that Levi Belfield was responsible for the Russell's murders. With a man already serving a sentence for this crime, getting his conviction overturned may take either a confession of guilt by someone else or concrete new forensic evidence. And I don't think we've quite got that here. Although Belfield denies responsibility for any other crimes, 
I believe criminological links to Melanie Hall provide compelling reasons for the police to redouble their efforts to solve this crime. Melanie's case fits his victim selection and his M.O. very closely. Ford car keys were found at the scene and we know that Belfield had a number of Ford cars. Now that we've shown his links to the same geographical area, I strongly believe the police should be urgently looking into the connections between this crime and Levi Belfield. New Killers Behind Bars next Thursday at 9. And Professor David Wilson is answering your questions on Twitter right now. Tweet your questions using the hashtag Killers Behind Bars. Next year on Channel 5, the real life crime continues with brand new Twisted Born to Kill and the BTK killer Dennis Lynn Raider.